All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Susan Sikekoptiwa. I serve as assistant agent for the federally recognized tribal extension program up here at Hopi. We are happy that you've joined us tonight to learn more about horses. We've offered some poultry workshops in the past, gardening workshops, um, some ranching workshops. It's been a, a little over a year since we've done that. So we're really happy that you're gonna join us tonight. I am so pleased to turn the time over to Ms. Ms. Betsy Green and Ashley Wright. They are actually going to be leading the session tonight. They are extension specialists that are coming to us from Southern Arizona. They'll let you know where they're coming in from. So thank you, Betsy. Thank you, Ashley. And thanks for everyone for joining us. I'm going to turn it over to see. Excellent. <clears throat> so it's been a while since I've been up there. We are so looking forward to doing things back in person for everyone and just excited. But tonight we'll start <laughs> from afar. And what I'm going to do is do an intro to horse diseases and biosecurity. Tonight, I'm going to give you a start with some things to think about that will go into detail down the road a little bit further. And then we'll go to Ashley for the majority of the time to talk about things that you can do to check for safety and fit and all kinds of wonderful things with horse with your horse tack. Okay, so biosecurity, what is it? First of all, it is practices and procedures that reduce the risk of infectious disease. So it's the prevention. It's the stuff that you can do so that you don't have to pay vet bills or lose horses to disease or have them have permanent impacts from a disease. So the benefits, healthier horses, fewer vet bills, and a lot of you are saying, yeah, like it's pretty tough to get a vet to come. We certainly don't want to pay vet bills unless it's for prevention. And that's also environmentally sound. But the key part is prevention. So biosecurity sounds like you have to do a lot, but I'm going to show you some simple things that you can put into play anywhere with your horses at home or at a show or at the county fair or at Gymkhana, whatever, whatever you do, okay? So first I'll just tell you that we have this um, extension.arizona.edu slash horse. And this is a screenshot of the front page. And look, you got a summer equine workshop series on the calendar on the right. And that's, this is the first, is this one tonight. You've got if you go to extension.arizona.edu slash horse, then you can find horse publications and videos, things about symposiums. Here's a whole piece about keeping your horse safe that has some posters and uh, resources for you to take a look at as well to get some more information. And then also events. So. Lots of great resources right at your fingertips. Just email or put that into Dr. Google. You can find a lot of resources right there to go work from. So first thing to think about, this menu. Can you guys see that menu or is that just on mine? Must be just done mine. I don't see it, Betsy. Perfect. So it was just in my way. <laughs> so. When you're thinking about horse health, again, we're talking prevention. So we have to treat sick animals, but we want to avoid sick animals if we can. So first of all, how many horses do you have on the property? How much you know, land do you have for them? Is it pasture? Is it um, fencing, barns, pens, whatever? All those things can come into play. And we'll just talk about a little bit of that as we go. So do you have exposure to a lot of other horses? How do you handle new animals when they come onto your property? Do you just turn them into the paddock or pasture with your own horse or do you horses or do you separate them out? That can make a difference on whether someone's bringing in a sick horse and you expose all of your horses. Okay. You know, if you know it's sick or if you have a horse that gets sick, how do you handle that horse? Do you separate it out and quarantine it from your other horses? A lot of times you can keep any sick horse issues down to a minimum if you just take a few steps. All right, so what else? Vaccinations and deworming. I know probably 
several of you may go to vaccination clinics down at um, the vet building there that we've done some workshops, the vet tech building there. But, you know, how often do you do that? And what are your horse's needs for that? And then one of the key things that we're going to talk about that are some simple things to, well, I say simple, but it's not always simple depending on what your horse's water sources are but how you can potentially decrease contamination. Okay, so the first thing, you notice if you've ever, you know, don't double dip. If you have someone that you have and they're dipping French fries into the ketchup or the mustard or the honey mustard, and then they put their mouth on it and nom, nom, dip it back in and you're like, I don't want your slobber. <laughs> okay, so... If you look at that horse, he doesn't have a French beret. He has a little ice pack on his head because it's indicating that he's sick and you can see the snot coming out of his nostrils. If you, just a simple thing, if you're working with a horse, horses and you're watering them and they have individual water sources, then you can actually not put that hose end into the water because a lot of times, what do you do? You put it right in the water so that it'll stop spraying out, right? Well, if you do that and you do that with this horse, suddenly you're taking, you're putting in clean water and you're taking potentially some of his bacteria or viral load that because he's sick. And then you're dipping that right into the next horse's stall, a water bucket or trough. So that can actually be you carrying the disease from one horse to another. So don't double dip. So just take it, spray it without putting it into the water. That's a simple thing you can do right now. Another thing, if you have, you look at these and obviously the guy on the lower right is sick. He's putting all kinds of nasty slobber and snot and gross things into the water trough. And these guys are saying, yeah, gross. So obviously many of you probably have troughs like we do where the horses, have, multiple horses have access. So if it's the same horses and they're in the same condition and they're kept together, no big deal. But if one is sick or a new horse comes in or you took one out to the roping and it was nose to nose with another sick horse, then you should probably separate that horse off and have its own water source and not have access to the, water, the community water because you don't wanna get your other horses sick, okay? And this bring your own equipment is also another thing that comes up because a lot of times some of the diseases that we'll talk about and in this and future are things like ringworm that can be passed from horse to horse with brushes and saddle pads. And so look at here, oh, Jubal and Clover. I certainly wouldn't want to use the, <laughs> the brushes from the horse on the right to brush Jubal here on the left because I can pass that, that in, in case of ringworm, a fungus, to him. And in fact, it's zoonotic, so I can pass it to myself. A lot of people have gotten horse, have ringworm from their horses and vice versa. So if you, if you have a barn and group of horses and you use the brushes, nobody's sick, nobody has any contaminating things like ringworm, it's not that big a, a deal. It's when you have a new horse or a sick horse or an infected horse that you have to separate it out. And you can also do some disinfecting. And especially if there's a change in the horse's status. So if the horse does get sick, make sure you're disinfecting all the things that he uses. So saddles, tack, barn, all the things like that. And so if you have new additions to the field or barn, <laughs> then you should always quarantine them for at least two to three weeks. And they say this because most of the time it takes, it can take up to 14 days for some diseases to show. So they may have gotten strangles while they were in the, in the show barn with a bunch of other sick horses. And then they come home and they don't show it for another 10 days. But you, if you've turned them out with your horses, now all of a sudden, all of your horses might get strangles. So, and if you do have a horse that has a temperature or is showing some sort of illness, then quarantine them 
even if it's leaving a pen or a stall empty between them and their other horses, or, you know, and if there is any kind of sign of illness developing, have the vet check them at the first thing. A lot of first couple things you'll see, they'll stop eating and they may have a temperature. Okay. So those are some of the quick, quick things. Anytime they stop eating and anytime they have a temp, look closely. And always, always work with that sick horse last. So you don't go from sick to healthy because then you'll have be going from sick to sick the next time. Okay. And of course, we have all the wildlife that likes to eat our dog and horse feed. So we should store our feed in tightly closed, durable containers. If you have feed, uh, ration, or if you have hay, then you can set it up, try and keep keep the varmints out of it. Good luck with that, I understand. But, but also, if you can, protect your water source. And also check your water source because a horse can get really sick if a animal crawls in and dies. Even if you have something that, like we have a log that we put on the edge of the big water trough so that if something crawls in, it has a way to get out. Because if it dies, your horse could actually get very ill from that carcass in the water. And don't put out pet, you know, pet food for where the other wildlife can get it as well. And the sooner you find a problem, less chance you'll have of spreading disease. Okay, as far as medical care, here's the guys that's like kindergarten. When you send your kids to school and they each come back with a different virus to share with you, <laughs> cold or flu or whatever. Um, if, you, if you have horses that are really, really old, it's probably not a good idea to put a really, really young set of horses together because they could be carrying some diseases and the horse um, could not, could possibly not, um, you know, be as strong with immunity because of their age. You can use Clorox to disinfect. You've got to certainly rinse well because you also have to make sure that it doesn't have a taste, um, you know, that where the horse won't drink it because then you've got another whole problem. And if you do have your horse traveling and around other horses, for sure, you want to take, you know, establish a routine vaccination. That's something you'd work with your local vet as to what is important based on the area you live in, the time of year, and the activity and use level of your horses. If you're going to a bunch of shows or gymkhanas or ropings, you would be worth your time and effort to make sure your horse has decent uh, vaccinations. Okay, this little guy right here is something I'm going to show you that you can actually find out. And so you can see, and this is something called the Equine Disease Center. And it's really cool because you can see what's happening in your state. And you notice on here, I took a screenshot. This is all screenshots. This is Arizona, and back in July and June, we had quite a bit of vesticular stomatitis, which is a reportable disease. So if you're a vet finds a horse or a cow or, or stock with that, they have to tell the state vet. But here we had it in Maricopa. We had it confirmed cases, and we also had some in Apache County back in June of 2020, this website actually tracks diseases. And so you could actually click on New Mexico if you were going to a bunch of ropings or a clinic or something over there and find out what kind of diseases they have going on. So the alerts and outbreaks, this communication center website is really good. And just to show you, this is October 18th of 2018. I just did some, had some equine herpes virus a couple of years ago had some West Nile virus in Navajo and Coconino counties, had some West Nile in Phoenix area as well. So just showing you what can be around and what's actually happening within your state. And so if you want the outbreaks for Arizona, you have West Nile, rabies, that was down in the Nogales area, right when Ashley and I were writing a rabies <laughs> publication equine herpes virus, and then this year, vesticular stomatitis. So this is something that, take a look through that and check and see. It's kind of fun to look around. Not fun if you're finding out that it's one of your horses, but 
there's also a lot of good information throughout there. So some quick tips, if you have a newer sick animal, quarantine them, enforce biosecurity methods. So don't share things, sharing can cause, can share diseases like ringworm and other things as well. Um, treat or care for the sick animal last and then disinfect your footwear or clothing, use different equipment so that you don't bring the bacterial or viral disease to your healthy horses. So of course, UA Cooperative Extension, we bring people with different skills together to solve problems that matter to you. So, and look, you guys are front and center. Do we have anyone that was at this event when we could be in person and we will be again? Yeah, that's out here at Hopi. I can't yeah. See. Okay. And with that, I'm going to turn you over to Ashley, unless there's other questions. Perfect. All right, guys. So we're going to talk um, about tax selection, care, and safety. You might be wondering... What does this have to do with keeping our horses healthy? Well, it actually has a lot to do with that. So the first reason for this is human safety and horse safety. Um, Our equipment is uh, important to our riding. And if things are breaking on us, we are going to have a safety issue. If reins are breaking, we could have horses run away, um, get into a wreck, crash through a fence, we could have, if, if certain pieces of our saddle, we could have riders falling off. I have some stories to share with you a little later on in this about some wrecks caused by improper tech. Um, so that's one really important reason. The next one is that good equipment is expensive to repair or replace. Um, we all know how expensive uh, our high-end tech can be. Um, and in some cases, it could even be irreplaceable. Um, I'm sure many of you probably have granddad's, great-granddad's saddle or headstall or something similar. And if an accident were to happen to that, um, that might be an irreplaceable item to you. Um, And finally, that's going to prevent vet bills and the loss of use of that horse by preventing these accidents or even preventing things as simple as saddle sores that stop us from being able to use our horse when we'd like. um, We're going to have a better experience overall and a healthier horse. So we're going to start with some things about tack care and selection. I'm sorry, tax selection first, and then I'm going to finish up with how to kind of care for some of your equipment uh, to make sure it's lasting longer and all those things. So let's start with our saddle. Um, The big thing is going to be what discipline do you ride? I'm going to guess most of you probably are riding Western, so you're going to be looking for a Western saddle. But as you'll see in a minute, there's a very large variety. The second thing you want to consider is what size, kind, shape of horse do you have? That's going to really um, be crucial in making sure that we do the, that we get the right saddle. It's important that that saddle fits that horse properly, um, and also that it fits you properly. So the first, the three steps for this are number one: decide what type of saddle you need, and we're going to go over those in a second. From that, pick a saddle that fits both the rider and the horse. Now there are some things that you can fix with different types of pads and that kind of stuff, but there are some things that are kind of unfixable. Um, So it's important that we get something that at least is in the realm of fitting reasonably to start. And then finally, select the rigging, the material, the finishing touches. Do you need a breast collar? Do you need a back cinch? All those sorts of things that you prefer on your saddle. So the key here is picking the right saddle for your discipline. Obviously, the needs of all four of these riders are going to be very different. We have this barrel racer over here who really needs to be able to get down low, get her center of gravity down low, get a a saddle horn that she can really get a hold of so she can help that horse get around that barrel in a balanced manner. Versus our team roper down there in the left um, needs to have a saddle that is sturdy and stays in place when he ropes that steer and dallies off to his horn. He can't have a horn like that barrel racer he'll probably just break off when he dallies to it, right? So it's really important that his saddle, number one, puts him in the right position to be able to get up and throw that lasso, but also is there to to hold onto that steer um, and take the weight of that when he finally makes his catch. And then obviously our English riders even have very different needs within their different disciplines. The next thing to think about, this is always the age old question, leather or synthetic. Most people I know go with leather, but synthetic does have some advantages. It's generally cheaper. It's generally very lightweight, and that makes it very easy care. If these get wet, it's no big deal. If they get super dirty, you can just take the hose to them and set them out to dry. It's no problem. Um, And they are generally cheaper. However, our traditional leather saddles have a lot of advantages too. 
while they're a little heavier, which may be better for some disciplines, they're also very durable. Like I mentioned, many of you probably have granddad, great granddad saddle, and it's still going perfectly fine and strong as long as it's cared for. These also are very repairable. If something happens, um, you know, stirrup leather breaks or things like that, those can be replaced. And then finally, we can't discount styling. Um, those synthetic saddles, as far as they've come, they just don't look as cool as a leather saddle ever will, or always does. So let's talk briefly about a few of the differences in the Western saddle types. And I'm not here to tell you, you should pick one type over another. Um, you should pick the type that fits your style of riding. So for many of you, this one in the upper right-hand corner here, this ranch saddle is probably gonna be what we're looking for. And you notice that it's got nice big swells, um, sort of a low, uh, large horn here. It's got in what we call in-tree rigging, which I'm gonna talk about later. Um, and it's set very sort of straight. Your legs sort of hang straight down in a very natural position. It's set up to have a back cinch. You can just sort of see that hanging underneath down there to help keep that saddle in place. Got lots of strings for tying extra gear, saddlebags, lassos, jackets, all those sorts of things on when we're spending all day in this saddle. So this saddle is designed to be both rugged and comfortable for all day. Compare that to something like, let's take a look at this cutting saddle over here. Notice the stirrup placement on this saddle, how far forward that really puts your feet. And if you think about what a cutting horse does when he's working a cow up and down the fence and really sort of slamming on the brakes and making quick turns and our rider needs to be able to sit that, they really are helped by having their feet sort of out in front of them a little bit. Um, so that works fantastic for that discipline because that really helps that rider keep that seat when the horse is making those quick movements. But I can tell you from experience, those bad, bad boys are uncomfortable to ride in for any length of time um, because of the way it sort of tucks you under, your lower back really starts to ache. So that might not be the saddle you're looking for if you plan to ride for hours at a time for many, many miles during the day. But if you're into cutting, that's your choice right there. So as you can see, all these saddles have little differences. We have our barrel saddle here, um, just a little bit of forward to those stirrups, not near as pronounced as with this cutting saddle, but look at this big old horn we have on both of these actually, um, so that if the rider needs something to grab for support, we have it. But you know that's not gonna take the weight of a steer if you need to dally off to it. But our rope and saddle up here is designed for that with that big horn. Nice big fender, sort of straight down, um, has that back cinch to help keep that saddle back into that saddle down and secure. And so as you can see, these are all a little different and have sort of have their own purposes. So the key is to sort of make sure you're picking the one that is um, right for you. Not only will it be more comfortable for you and your horse, it's also a safety issue, right? We don't want to exceed the limits of our gear. I'm just going to talk briefly about some of the different types of saddle rigging so that when you're purchasing a saddle or maybe looking at a different saddle, you understand what's going on. Um, so we have a couple of things. So the first thing is the position of the rigging. So we have what's called full rigging, seven eighths, three quarter. That refers to the position of these D rings or O rings, whichever they happen to be, um, in relation to the saddle itself. So you see, you notice that, um, let's see, let's start with this saddle here. So our full rigging is way up here. You see that this D ring lines up basically right underneath what we call the swells of the saddle. And then look at this saddle here. Look at how far back this ring is compared to this one here, okay? So that further forward, more spread apart, that's gonna give us more stability in, in keeping our saddle on our horse. However, in some breeds or some types of horses and some types of movements, that may interfere with the horse's front leg movement. And that's why in some cases they're moved back. So this trail saddle in particular has actually two choices here. So you could choose full, you could choose what we call three quarter, or you could do this combined in the middle and end up in the seven eighths position. Um, and you'll often see this on like trail saddles that are meant to fit a variety of horses. So you could rig this saddle differently depending on your horse's needs. And then of course we have our back cinch set up here, here, and here, that's just to help sort of keep the back end of the saddle down, typically used for trail riders, uh, ropers, ranch riding, that sort of thing. So the other um, consideration we talk about the way a saddle is rigged is in skirt versus on tree rigging. Um, so that refers to how the rings are actually connected to the saddle. So this one's what's called in tree rigging. And what you can't see is this piece of leather here is actually attached directly to what's called the tree of the saddle, which is, you can think of it like the, the saddle skeleton. So it's attached directly to the bones of that saddle. And this is a very secure way to rig. 
It's very heavy duty, but it also does add a little extra bulk under the rider's legs um, here. But you often common, you commonly see this in those ranch and roping saddles. These two types of saddles have what's called in, in skirt rigging. So that D-ring you can see, it's just literally affixed right into the skirts of the saddle with rivets. So while this is um, maybe a little bit less secure um, for it, not that your saddle is gonna come off, but if you, you wouldn't wanna be roping with a saddle like this, um, but it also reduces a lot of bulk under the rider's leg, making it a lot more comfortable to ride in all day. So the sort of the trade-offs of the two types there. So let's talk about that saddle fit um, and how we want that saddle to fit our horse. So this is the tree of the saddle. This is a, where'd it go? There it is. This is a Western saddle. If you've never seen what this looks like, this is what is actually underneath if you were to take all the leather pieces off of your saddle. This one's an English saddle tree. So they're similar, but a little different. Typically these are wood covered in fiberglass. Although I think there are some new, newer, some more synthetic material type ones um, that are pretty popular now too, that are probably a little lighter. The important thing to note here is these are not standardized between brands. Um, so just because one company says this is our tree size and another one says the same thing, that does not mean they're both going to fit equally. Um, every saddle maker makes their trees slightly different. But this is the most important part to make sure if this tree has to fit your horse properly. Um, and once we get that taken care of, the rest sort of falls into place. So the big things we wanna look at here, first off is we see people giving what we call the gullet measurement all the time. So the gullet measurement is the measurement from here, the inside of the swells to the inside of the swells straight across. And while that's a good measurement to have, a lot of people think it indicates sort of how wide those bars are and how angled. And it really doesn't give you any indication at all as to how angled those bars are, which is gonna determine if it actually fits your horse's back or not. The width of the gullet really just helps you know if it's going to clear your horse's withers, um, particularly if you have a wide withered horse or not. Okay, so just because somebody tells you, oh, it's six and three quarter inches across or six and a quarter, that doesn't tell you anything about it. Typically, the way these are sized, you'll see things like full quarter horse. Generally, that's the widest or flattest one that they offer to fit our wide quarter horses. You'll see semi quarter horse, maybe for quarter horse like quarter horse thoroughbred cross type horses. Um, you may see things like Arabian. Um, and generally what that means is that as you're going more narrow, that's allowing the, these angles here to change and kind of come together. So more, more flat for those wide quarter horses. And as we move through semi and even to Arabian, we start to get more narrow if we're looking straight down that saddle. I think I have another picture. Here we go. This is a better one. So yeah, like I mentioned, you have regular, sometimes they call that full, sometimes they mean something different. Um, this is not standardized among any of the brands. So it's important that you, whatever brand you're looking at, you do some research. So in this particular instance, this is what happens if we have a saddle tree that is too wide for this horse. So as you can see, yes, the gullet is clearing the withers. You can imagine we're looking straight down the front of a horse who's had his head um, removed so that we can see what we're doing here. So here's the withers. And as you can see, the gullet clears fine. But look, these bars, these should actually be matching the angle of the horse's back. They should be laying as flat on that horse's back as possible and down their shoulders. And you can see this one is not. So as you can imagine, if you were sitting on this saddle, how all the pressure of your weight would fall right here instead of being evenly distributed along the tree of the saddle. Okay, we don't want that gap because then we get this pinching problem. So how do we know if our saddle fits properly and if our and if our tree fits properly, particularly if we can't see it because it's underneath all the leather and the skirting and all those things. So the best thing I can tell you to do is go out there one day, take your saddle, put it on your horse without a pad. We're not going to cinch you down. We're not going to get on it. Just set it on your horse. No saddle pad, just as we're doing here. Put it where you think it ought to, ought to go. And we're going to check a few things. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna check as we are in this top picture here, that the gullet of that saddle clears the withers by two to four fingers, preferably closer to four, because remember as you sit on it, it's gonna sink down a little bit. So just as she's doing that, we want that nice clearance to make sure we're not gonna rub on the top of the withers. If we are closer to two, that's okay. That can be fixed with a cutout pad. The other thing we wanna make sure is that that saddle is sitting level on that horse's back, that the, that the, the swells and the back of the seat are level across, we're not tilted one way or the other. 
And finally, what you want to do is run your hands underneath that saddle between the saddle and your horse's back. And what you're feeling is that that saddle has sort of even pressure across the tree from front to back. You don't feel any big gaps, any places where suddenly your hand can make contact with one and not the other, or any places where you can't fit your hand through because the fit is too tight. It should be fairly even on both sides and all the way down from front to back. And if all those things um, fall into place, chances are your saddle fits your horse fairly well. And remember, you can't out pad a bad fitting saddle. We can fix some minor fit problems with pads, but really we can't cover up, we can't put a band-aid on a really poorly fitting saddle. So true or false, the saddle that fits your horse perfectly today will always fit him perfectly. Okay, we got a couple of falses. Anyone going for true? Another false? Okay, well, good. You guys get the grand prize. Let's pretend this is the same horse, and I know it's not, but let's pretend it is in three different phases of his life. Let's say he's young, he's growing, he doesn't have a whole lot of muscle tone yet. His, the saddle that fits him here is going to fit him quite differently than when he's in his prime, fit, ready to show, ready to go rope, ready to do some ranch work, whatever it is this horse is going to go do. Um, and then maybe um, something happens and we don't ride for a while and we don't cut the feed bill back a little bit and we end up with uh, this situation here. You can, that saddle is going to fit that horse very differently. Um, and so we need to make sure we're sort of assessing that fit somewhat regularly, um, especially if our horse has had a change in their physique. So some of the common uh, fit issues that we generally see, and I know this one is an English saddle, but it still demonstrates the same principles. So we have this well-fitting saddle. You see we have even pressure all the way along the, the tree. In this one, we have pressure here and here, but you see we don't, we're not really making contact with the horse's back in the middle. That's what's called bridging. And you'll get these pressure points here and here that are painful. And in this case, the back end isn't making contact. The middle is, but the front and the back are sort of able to rock back and forth. And again, we're going to end up with a pressure point sort of here in the middle and probably some problems with saddle slippage because of how much it's able to move. Um, that's that's what you might see a horse with like white, white hairs and stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I've got one. I should get a picture of it and put it in here that had a, a poor fitting saddle for some time before I got him because right on both sides of his withers, um, right here and right here, he has two white patches of hair that he was not born with. Um, it is from a poor fitting saddle, um, killing the, those hair follicles so that they produce white hair instead of colored hair. Like he, he's a babe, so they should be brown. And it, and the damage goes deeper than the hair. The hair is just the tell right. the telltale. It's just the telltale sign, definitely. Um, so a couple of ways you can uh, really tell if you're another another thing you can do is if you pull your saddle off of your horse and the sweat pattern looks like this. You see, this is an indication of bridging, how the sweat pattern is very uneven. What we want to see when we pull our saddle and pads off of our horse is a very even sweat pattern all the way along where the saddle would be sitting. And this is just an example. This is that Western tree sitting right on that horse's back, just so you can kind of see how that tree actually fits on there. And so you can see you should have this proper full panel contact all the way along. We don't want bridging. We don't want in the middle here, this is that rocking, this one where the middle is, is making contact, but the front of the back really aren't. And in this one, we've got something going on lopsided. Um, one thing you could always should always be checking for is that your, your shuttle tree is intact, particularly if you've had a wreck. Um, those trees can actually crack and break. Um, they're not indestructible. And so if you have a wreck, particularly if a horse flips over on a saddle or it falls out of a truck, going down the highway, something like that happens, definitely check that tree. The best thing to do is to kind of sit um, behind it, grab hold of that horn and really kind of pull it back on itself. And it should not have any give in it at all. Um, if it does, it's an indication that something could be broken and it needs to be looked at. So just a quick follow-up why this is so important. Um, preventing sores and injury to the horse and the rider due to improper fit. As you can imagine, if you rode that horse with a poor fitting saddle like that two or three days in a row, he's probably gonna get sore. He's probably gonna get crabby. He's probably more likely to do things like buck, rear, have a blow up or something like that because he's in pain. Um, we also are gonna prevent accidents due to this. So, um, you know, for using the wrong type of saddle, for trying to rope a calf in a barrel saddle. 
and it pulls our horn off or the, the cinch blows apart or something like that happens, we're gonna prevent some accidents by using the right thing. Um, again, you don't wanna exceed the limits of your gear. Um, are, were there any questions about any of this before I move on to care? I have a question. Yes. Do you need both the front and the rear cinch on a ranching horse? So it depends on how hard you are riding. I typically ride um, on the ranch with a back cinch. A couple of reasons. I tend to be going up and down really rough terrain, particularly down. That helps to keep the back of your saddle sort of where it belongs. And then also if you're doing any sort of roping or anything like that, um, that's definitely a good idea to have a back cinch. Um, if you're sort of more the leisurely ranch rider, almost like trail type riding, um, and you're not doing any roping, then you could probably get away without it. Great, thanks. You're welcome. So what we should really do is buy a saddle that will fit. Like if we get a new horse, take, take that horse to the saddle shop and fit him up over there right yeah, yes ideally yes and i know this is the real world and that is not always possible um but if it is if you can borrow trade barter for a different saddle that fits better that would be ideal um, and there are some types of saddles that will generally fit most horses um, like i mentioned those trail saddles with the riggings um, they make some new flex tree ones that have a little bit more ability to fit a wider variety of horses um, but yeah, ideally you would bring that horse home. And if you don't have a saddle that fits them properly, um, try to find one that does. Yeah. If, if, keep them sound. If nothing else, you try your saddles rather than, than just, you know, say, oh, this is the one I'm going to use on him. Try your saddles one and see what fits the best. So let's move on and talk about how we can care for this equipment um, as I mentioned, this equipment is an investment and in some cases um, is irreplaceable, um, but also equipment that's excessively dirty um, is more likely to gall a horse, um, which is create saddle sores um, and that sort of problem going on. Um, that sweat, salt, hair, grime that builds up underneath there, if you can imagine putting that down on your arm and then just rubbing it back and forth for hours with all your weight on it. As you can imagine, your skin is probably going to get pretty irritated, right? Also, equipment that's not cared for is more likely to fail under stress. Um, if that leather has been saturated and dried over and over again with salty sweats and never given any condition and never cleaned, um, there's a chance that some things could start to break. Um, and the process of caring for that gear, the process of taking it apart and cleaning it, putting it back together, gives you an opportunity to inspect it regularly and find those potential failures before they become potential failures. Um, so I have a little story to tell. This is my friend Warengo, um, and Warengo was not mine. He belonged to a gentleman up the street who asked me to come do some riding for him while he was out of town. He said, you can use all his gear. It's all there. It all fits him. It's fine. And um, he is actually a uh, Peruvian Paso, so he's gated. He's pretty fun to ride. But Ed, the guy that owns this horse, was not well known for taking care of his equipment. Um, he tended to just put it back in the tack room and never, ever took, cleaned it or took it off or, or did anything like that with it. And so I had no trouble. So I got Warringo out and I saddled him up and went to ride. I rode down the street to pick up my friend who was riding with me and I tied Warringo up in their barn. And somebody came out of the tack room carrying another saddle and it spooked him. Just one of those little type spooks. And when he did that, the off billet, which is basically this on the other side holding the cinch on, just broke just broke right there. So now I have a horse spooking, tied up, saddled, and the only thing holding the saddle on, which is not really holding it on, is the breast collar and the back cinch. The front cinch is no longer attached on the offside to the saddle. So as you can imagine, if I had actually been on him when this happened, this would have been a pretty serious wreck. I would have ended up with the saddle flipped underneath him. I probably would have come off. He would have bucked me off. Um, it would not have been pretty. As it was, I was able to calm him down and get everything taken off before he flipped the saddle underneath himself, but we were very close to a major wreck. And what had happened was that off billet had been soaked in sweat and dried and soaked in sweat and dried and never cleaned or inspected. Um, once he, set, he had it set where he wanted it, he never looked at it again. And eventually that sweat wore through it and that little spook and that little hook movement was enough to pop the leather um, and completely break that off billet. So Ed had a little bit of a track record. He also broke a rein one time in a similar fashion. 
um, right up, right up near here. This is a common place for them to get sort of salty and drooly and all those sorts of things. Um, and again, never cleaned it. And eventually one day he went to pull on it and it just popped. Um, so that's my little moral of the story. This really does happen. Um, and it could happen to you. It almost happened to me. So, so how do we spot these failures waiting to happen? So number one is leather that cracks or flat out breaks. That's all I did to this was bend it at 90 degrees. So if it starts to crack on the surface as this one has done, um, when you bend it, that's an indication that it's, it's working on failure. Leather, leather that feels very brittle and dry or excessively soggy and damp, like it has just been saturated in oil because that can actually allow the fibers to start to stretch too much. Um, if we have rip stitching, missing or loose rivets, it's generally a problem. Leather that has stretched out over time or like these holes when they start to become elongated ovals rather than holes, um, that's an indication that we may be approaching a failure. And, and you can kind of tell those ones that have stretched over time, um, the, there'll be parts that are like more narrow than the, the rest where the fibers have sort of stretched and condensed together. Um, if you see any nicks, small tears, mouse damage is notorious for this. It may be a nick or a small tear now, but when you put that thing under stress of your weight in the stirrups, the cinch holding the saddle on, it could become a tear and it could actually rip all the way through once you've sort of compromised the integrity of those leather fibers. And also hardware that has rusted. Not only is it difficult to do or undo in an emergency situation, it could theoretically snap if it's been rusted through far enough. And especially if it's the, the cheaper, like more coated type hardware, all it takes is a little bit of salty sweat to get in underneath that coating and it will start to rust in a heartbeat. Um, I always recommend if you can go with the, the high quality stainless steel or brass stuff. And especially if you wanna pay special attention to the pieces that are critical to holding the saddle in place. Really the only thing that holds the saddle on your horse is the front cinch, right? Everything else is just an accessory. The back cinch just helps keep the back end down um, if you're doing extreme type things. The breast collar just helps to keep things from twisting. Um, but the only thing really holding that saddle, the crucial part is your cinch, your latigo, your off cinch, your off billet, whatever you're using. So make sure you inspect these points very carefully. These rivets, if you have any sort of whatever your rigging type is, your latigos, your cinches, your off billets on the other side, your stirrups and your stirrup leathers, um, not only are those most likely to fail under stress when they feel your weight in them, you don't want to be at a dead gallop, go to make a turn and suddenly have no outside stirrup because it's blown off. Um, and then also reins, uh, just because they tend to get wet when the horse drinks out of the water trough, so they get wet and dry. Um, and also they're pretty critical to stopping your horse. So these are the ones that are either most likely to break, but also most likely to cause an actual accident if they fail. So every time you take your saddle off, you should tie up the rigging. Um, it, it makes me cringe to see people walking around with saddles with cinches trailing in the dirt behind them, picking up burrs and goat heads and all kinds of stuff that's going to cause a wreck when it pokes your horse while you're riding them. So what I do is I take my back cinch, run it through my front cinch, and there's this convenient little keeper on the sides of most saddles. You can thread that right through. And I tie up my front latigo, and I've actually tied it up in such a way that when I undo this knot and pull, it will all just come out. So I don't have to stand there and unravel it just to tie it up again. It will all just pull right out. And then I throw the breast collar up over the top. Um, and because it's underneath this, it will actually stay fairly well. So this does a couple of things. Number one, you're not dragging your stuff around, stepping on it, tripping over it, and dragging it through the muck and the dirt and the goat heads. Um, but also when you go to throw your saddle up over your horse, you don't end up with the cinch kind of left behind on the wrong side underneath the saddle that you then have to extricate. Um, some of us who have goosey horses uh, know what uh, how that could go sometimes. So that the way that's tied up, when you go to throw that over your horse's back, it will clear every time and end up on the other side. It also gives you an opportunity to check the fit and safety. You have to walk around to the other side and let that cinch down. It gives you an opportunity to make sure that everything on the off side is okay um, lined up, nothing's tucked underneath, you don't have stuff in weird places um, before you actually uh, do your cinches up and, and cinch up. So the proper order for saddling, and I, I say this because it's a safety issue and I have seen, I've seen some things, guys. Um, saddle pad, obviously, 
put it in the right place, maybe slightly forward of where you actually want it. Um, put your saddle on and you want to try to sort of slide back into the perfect spot. You don't want to pull forward because you're pulling against the hair coat. Let it sort of slide back into the position you want. Once it's in the good spot, walk around the other side, let down that cinch, check everything on that side, make sure we're good. Do your front cinch. Do not walk away. Do not get distracted. Don't do anything. Don't move your horse. Don't do anything until you've done the front cinch. Like I mentioned, that is the only thing that is actually holding the saddle on their horse. I have seen people do the back cinch and the breast collar and then the front cinch. And that's just a recipe for disaster for ending up with a, a horse that spooks or takes a step and ends up with the saddle underneath. And then you've got a wreck. It doesn't matter how well broke your horse is. I don't, I know very few horses who would not blow up at that, including some that would otherwise be known as bomb proof. And then you may go ahead and do your back cinch and your breast collar. And then I like to take the horse on a quick little walk, 30 yards, doesn't have to be far. And then go ahead and tighten that front cinch all the way up. That gives you an opportunity to avoid any, any spooky bow ups, anything like that. Um, you can make sure everything's sort of fitting right. And then go ahead, head stall, and you're good to go. Got a question about how important is the thickness of the saddle or thickness or width of the saddle pad? Uh, so it is important. Um, I, I don't like to see just those super thin wool ones and nothing else. I do want to see something else underneath there. But other than that, it's sort of preference and how well your horse fits like this. So this pad is, it's that thin wool on top, but what you can't see, in fact, actually, I think I have a picture later on of it upside down and I'll show you. There's actually a felt, um, I think it's five eighths um, pad under each side on both sides. So I like that that three eighths to five eighths sort of range is, is generally good for most horses. You don't want too much either. Too much pad will allow your saddle to move and slip around too much. So if you find you're having to pad that much, um, there's a chance you have a fit problem that needs to be taken care of. But they um, should make sure that that saddle pad shows around the whole base of the whole saddle though, right? Yes, yes. You wanna make sure that it extends around the base of your skirts all the way around. So this is a big skirted roping saddle. So I had to get a big pad. I wouldn't want to try to do one of those little round barrel pads underneath this type of saddle. What I don't want is, is these skirts because these are kind of stiff, right? I don't want these coming off and poking them in the hip or jamming them in the side or anything like that. I want to make sure all of my, my saddle is over my saddle pad. Um, then one, one last question on that. Do you lift up the withers part? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. So saddle pad goes on slightly forward of where I would prefer it. Saddle goes on in the right spot on the pad and then sort of just shift everything into the right spot. It should, ju it should just fall right where it belongs. And then go ahead and pull that pad up into the withers. Um, Cause when I cinch it down, I don't wanna, I don't wanna create like a pull down effect where I'm pulling it down onto the withers. I wanna make sure there's no pressure on top of those withers. So um, you're, and, you're, just, you're just using like one hand to pull just the saddle pad straight up into the gullet. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And it, it shouldn't take much because you're not cinched down at this point. So it should just be a quick little pull up to get the to get that front part of the saddle pad up off of the withers and tucked up into the gullet of the saddle, if that makes sense. Uh, Ashley. Yes. Um, a wool cinch compared to like a nylon synthetic mm -hmm. cinch and uh -huh. then also uh, leather head stall compared to um, braided nylon and Rain, uh, leather reins uh -huh. compared to um, braided nylon, which do you prefer? That is totally your preference. Um, and part of that comes down to um, cleaning. So the, like the, the mohair cinch, like what I've got on this horse here, um, is going to take a little bit more care, right? We got to make sure we don't end up with goat heads and stuff stuck in it all the time. Um, it will pick up sweat, but they also tend to have the, like a little more stretch so that they like, I've seen some people take some of those synthetic cinches and they have no give to them at all. And then if you, if you cinch up too tight, um, remember your horse still has to breathe and that's their rib cage that needs to expand with every breath. So if we've sucked them up so tight that they can't get a breath in and get their rib cage expanded, we've got a problem. So I tend to prefer those type. Um, if you do go with the other type, just be cautious as far as cleanliness, I find them just as easy to give them a rinse. I'll talk about how to, how to clean those. Same thing with reins. I have both. I ride with both. I happen to have cotton ones on this one. Um, again, I think that's your preference as to what you prefer in your hand. Um, and the same thing with head stalls. The, the synthetic stuff is going to be easier to clean. You can throw it in a tub of water with some Dawn dish soap, 
scrub it, rinse it, it's good to go. Leather's gonna take a little bit more care, um, if that makes sense. I, I Again, I have a few of each and I, whatever I sort of felt like that day is what I, wrote, what I wrote. Is that, is that, I know that's not probably super helpful, but that really is most of it. So I don't ever tie a horse up with the head stall, no matter what, um, because they have this bit in their mouth and they will sit back and they will damage. And what will, what'll generally happen is, is it's usually a horse that doesn't ever set back and they'll sort of set back and it'll hurt, right? Because that they've got that bit in their mouth and then they sort of get panicked. And then it sort of creates a problem that you didn't have before. And now you have a problem because they did it once and, and just a little bit and hurt themselves and panicked over it, right? So you notice he has his head stall on or his halter on underneath his head stall. And that's what he's tied up with. And I'll just, I'll just untie that lead rope. And you could either just, if it's got a buckle like this, I'll probably just take it off. Um, if it's, if it's actually just knotted to the head stall, I'll pull it around and just dally it around my saddle horn and just leave it for the ride. And then it's nice. Cause I, if I need to tie up to a tree or something while I'm not riding, I got to get off for something. I can just undally and tie right up to a tree or something and never have to tie up with my reins. Um, I don't ever recommend that for sure. And then these rope halters, just make sure you always tie your knot. See how it's tied up above the, the knot here? This is the little loop right here, if you can imagine that. You always want to tie that knot up there. If you tie down here, it's not good. And if you tie, and I've tied it this way so that the tail hangs away from his eye. And this way, if he does set back, that shouldn't tighten up to the point where, um, and it's not tied up here. So it should never tighten up to the point where I can't get it undone to get it, get it off if he does happen to sit back on it this way. But yeah, I, and it doesn't matter how broke a horse is. I don't ever recommend tying up with reins. Like the most I ever do is my, this gelding is, is like so dead broke to tie. I may take a leather rein and loop it once over a railing so that if he does sit back, it's just going to come off. But at that point he thinks he's tied solid and he won't, he won't move anyway. So um, but if it was a horse that I knew would test it, I wouldn't try that. So when we secure the front cinch, we got a couple of options. We're going to ignore the English one for now. I usually give this talk to Betsy's um, equine class. So I do some English stuff that I've sort of taken out of this one. Again, that cinch needs to be tight, but not so tight the Hulk did it. Okay. If we're heaving and we've got to get it that tight, we've got a couple things wrong. We either have an improperly fitting saddle we're not being being uh, conscious about our weight distribution when we get on or are on. Um, or maybe we have a, a cinch problem. Maybe we're using a cinch that, that has too much give or not enough give or something like that. So it should be snug, but I should still be able to slide a hand back in there with, with not too much work. It should, I shouldn't have to wedge. I should be able to pull away and put a hand in there, if that makes sense. And it's one of those things that it's sort of hard to describe over Zoom, but when we get a chance to get up there in person, for sure, we'll do that and we'll show you guys what a what is a proper tightness so you kind of know. Um, there's a couple of ways to actually fasten a cinch. Some of them will have this little tab on here and you can just loop through twice, pick the hole you want, buckle it like a belt buckle, tuck your end up here. These are very secure. The plus side of this is it's not gonna slip. It's not gonna slide. Your knot's not gonna come undone. There's nothing to come undone. The downside is, is you only get these incremental adjustments, right? You either, and, and sometimes on some horses it lands, this is too loose and this one's too tight and you don't have a middle option. So you have to pick, do I want to be a little tighter than I'd prefer? Or do I want to be a little looser than I'd prefer? That's where this not option comes in. There's infinite adjustments. However tight you need it to be is how tight you need it to be. You do need to make sure you tie that knot properly. I don't ever recommend these if you're doing, have a synthetic latigo. Um, that synthetic latigo is more prone to slippage. Whereas a leather one like this one, these red leather ones, it's gonna hold tight to itself with friction a little better, a little less likely to slip. But uh, basically you loop, loop through, go up, go down the back, come across the front, just like tying a tie go up the back and we go down the middle again. And if your tail is too long, tuck it into your keeper. And if your tail is so long that when it comes out of the keeper, it drags on the ground, you need to cut it. Ask me how I know. You'll be loping along, it'll come out, your horse will step on it, cinch the saddle up super tight on himself on accident and have a little crow hop fit over it. So do not recommend cut that tail. So last couple slides here, cleaning our stuff is really important. We've gone over sort of inspecting and selecting and that sort of thing. So let's talk about cleaning. Our non-leather goods are super easy. 
Um, after each ride, if you have access to running water where you are, I highly recommend giving it a quick rinse. This is Arizona, things dry fairly quickly here. It will be dry by the next day if you need it again. Um, and then hang those, especially those saddle pads. This is the bottom of that saddle pad, by the way. Hang them upside down to dry over the fence rail. Uh, whatever you got, if you got a saddle pad handy um, so that they can dry, and then as soon as they're dry, sort of put them away. Um, if you can do that, that really cuts down on the accumulation of sweat and grime. It really cuts it down. Um, and then that, that makes it go longer between when you need to do a deep clean. So a deep clean, use a curry like this guy here, loosen all this, all this stuck on hair down here, get all that sort of worked out. If you have a pressure washer, that works great. Um, but if you don't, that's okay. Spray it with the hose. Use a, I use an equine shampoo, the same shampoo I would use on my horse. Um, I feel better that if I didn't get all of that out, I'm not going to create a problem with residue um, causing him a skin issue. So I wouldn't recommend using anything too harsh. I like to use the equine shampoo. Use that same curry. Scrub, scrub, scrub. Rinse thoroughly. Hang upside down to dry. Um, the pressure washer help, just helps with getting stuff sort of loosened and off and rinsed through a little bit faster. Your other... Um, non-leather goods here, your, your um, nylon or rope cinches, mohair cinches. These are some paracord braided reins. I might throw that little leather flapper over the edge of the bucket so it doesn't get soaked. Same thing, equine shampoo, hot water, let them soak, get in there and wash them around a little bit, scrub them together. That usually about does the trick. Rinse thoroughly, hang to dry. That's pretty easy, pretty basic. Th those guys are easy care. It's the nice thing about synthetic non-leather stuff is it's pretty easy care. Our leather stuff, however, I highly recommend after every ride, um, use a slightly damp cloth or a sponge, just water. doesn't have to be saturated, just damp to wipe down particularly the sweatiest parts of things, the inside of your back cinch, the inside of your breast collar, your latigo, your head stalls to just to get most of the dirt and the sweat off. That will go a long way towards preserving your equipment for a long time. And then periodically we wanna take things apart as far as you're comfortable. Um, clean it with a leather cleaner, allow it to dry and apply a leather conditioner. Um, again, this is gonna give us a couple opportunities, right? The, when we break, when we take things apart, we start looking at things we can find those potential failures. We may say, hey, uh, this uh, latigo is looking like it's pretty stretched out and it might actually break on me. It might be time to just go ahead and replace that piece because that is a wearable component. Don't soak leather in water. Don't use harsh cleaners, um, no bleach, no Lysol, no, none of that stuff. Do not turbo dry your leather. Don't put it in the sun. Don't put it in the hair, use a hairdryer on it. Don't put it in front of the fireplace. You don't want to over dry it. Um, Arizona is plenty dry enough. It will dry on its own um, out of the sun in a couple of hours. And then finally, don't oversaturate that leather with whatever conditioner or oil you're using. Um, oversaturated is also bad. Um, it will allow those fibers to start to stretch more. Um, and you're going to end up with some more problems. So one or two light coats is sufficient. Um, saddle soaps, Feeblings, Leather New, Lexol makes a whole line. I'm not, any of these products are fine. Use whatever works for you or has been working for you. There's some specialty cleaners like Leather CPR. I wouldn't use anything that's specifically for like car interiors and stuff like that. They're probably just not sturdy enough for our gear. Um, our gear is subject to a little bit more harsh environment and, and things. Um, and then the last one on there was sold to me by an old saddle maker and I hesitated, but I have actually used it quite a bit and found it to work very effectively on extremely dirty things. Murphy's oil soap, the kind for wood floors, the plain original basic diluted in warm water because it doesn't strip the wood. It also doesn't strip the leather and it does a really good job getting stuff clean if you've got something that's especially grimy. I usually do a little, a little one quart Tupperware of hot water and maybe a tablespoon or two of Murphy's at the most. So kind of like if you're putting mop the floor stuff, that kind yeah. of. Yeah, that kind of dilution. Yeah, it's pretty dilute. Yep. And then on your conditioner side, Neats Foot Oil is very common. There's some specialty conditioners like that Lexol NF, which is a non-darkening dressing. That's my favorite. If you do have a super blonde light saddle that you want to keep super blonde and light, like it's a show saddle or something, definitely test a little patch somewhere unseeable to make sure it's not going to darken your saddle um, before you use it. I don't recommend olive, any other type of vegetable oil. I've seen people recommend those. Those can go rancid um, and tend to over condition. I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm a big fan of this, this um, Lexol NF non-darkening, but plain needs for oil works as well. Lexol makes some of these other ones. There's several other brands that make um, 
leather conditioners. So when we're cleaning the rest of our leather equipment, I do not know why that picture is so blurry. Um, a small dish pan is helpful with some Dawn dish soap for your metal bits, buckles, et cetera. Anything that's full metal, just pop it right on there with some hot water. Your leather cleaner, a couple of clean rags are helpful. A clean towel, an old toothbrush for scrubbing into little tight crevices. Um, if you have a bridle that uses Chicago screws, a flat screwdriver for taking those apart is helpful. And if you have silver concho, some sort of silver polish. This is my head stall. I took it completely apart. Um, make sure you know how it all goes back together. Remove the bit. Any buckles like these, I wouldn't undo because that's an annoying one to undo. But if they were like just tied on the ends or something like the, these ones down here, I would totally take off. Again, dish pan of hot water. Use hot water, a little leather cleaner on a rag, sponge, toothbrush, whatever you need. Clean all those leather bits, especially the dirty places under the back cinches, your latigos, crown piece of the headstock gets really sweaty. And again, this is your chance to inspect these areas. So pay attention. I, I like to put something on the TV I've seen and just sit around and clean tack on a rainy day. Um, use a clean damp rag to get rid of any cleaner residue and then a clean towel to just sort of start the drying process. Allow that gear to dry. Don't turbo dry it. While it's drying, I go wash up those bits and buckles that have been soaking. Anything caked on them should come off pretty easy at that point. Once that gear is dry, one or two coats of whatever your leather conditioner is, very light. You don't want to be heavy handed here. You don't want to soak it. Um, you don't want to drown it. If, it may be, if it's been super dry, it may need a couple more coats, but keep them kind of light and you'll kind of know when it's done and then reassemble and inspect. So I found this while I was taking pictures of this saddle for you guys today. I took the... Uh, um, you can see here, I took the stirrup off. Got a little mold issue going on here. And this is mouse damage. So this stirrup leather is compromised. Um, this one's actually synthetic, the, this, these inside ones. This is leather, this is synthetic. Um, but this is damaged. I would not ride with this. Um, if I get into a situation where I'm having a problem, I need to know my stirrup is not gonna break if I put all my weight into it. Um, so I will get this replaced. Um, but the good news is these are fairly easy to replace. Um, Spectre D-rings, these rivets are seated well. My stitching is in good shape right here. So these are good to go. This little wear is fine. It's these rivets and the stitching in particular. And finally, storage, no critters, no mice, no sunlight. Um, you don't, you know, th these are subject to enough sunlight while we're out riding. You don't want to leave your saddle just sitting out in the sun all the time. That will break it down. Um, the same thing with weather exposure, if it's getting wet when it monsoons and then drying out and wet and dry and wet and dry, that's not good for it either. Don't leave it in your truck bed, hanging on the fence rail, anything like that. Ideally, you have a tack room, the storage shed, a corner of the garage, a space in the barn. Even the tack room of your trailer is better than it sitting outside. Just do whatever you can to kind of protect these. Remember that mice love them. They like to shred the, uh, the felting on the bottom of saddles and the bottom of saddle pads, take it for their nests. Apparently they like to chew on stirrup leathers. Um, cats can be a problem. Uh, just do what you can to keep keep those critters out of them. Thank you. Okay, what kind of questions do we have? So, so uh, Brett had a question. Can animals get sick from equine poop or manure if they are sick? <clears throat> and it depends on what they're sick with. But yes, there are things that can be transferred um, to an, other animals or people as well. So certainly it would depend on what it is. Some things are transmissible, some are not. It depends too, like for example, the, a lot of diseases are transmissible through body fluids. So that would be, you know, snot from their nose, whether it's blowing it onto another animal, onto the water trough, onto whatever. And then other things like if, if a horse has strangles, then has a neck you know, has popped an abscess under here and then rubs it on the fence that could contain the bacteria that causes it. So depends on what, um, what it is, but that's a possibility. Yeah. No more questions. Anybody else? Everyone have a great night. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you, Ashley. Have a good night, everyone. We'll see you next month.